Good afternoon. I see participants joining in, so I'll give everybody a bit of time to join before we start. Welcome to the uh, 120th uh, branch meeting. Uh, this will be the last one for 2023. Um, I'll just slowly start with some branch updates while I still see that participants are joining us. Um, today we have Elodie Chalhoop, if I mention it correctly, from Clyde & Co. present. Uh, to give us an update on the UAE and Saudi workplace health and safety requirements, legal requirements. Um, I've seen the presentation. I think it's very interesting. Uh, good to know in what the developments are and where we stand within these countries. So uh, a warm welcome as well to any of the KSA Saudi uh, members uh, who join in for this uh, webinar. Um, but I will start off with some uh, introduction and branch updates uh, from the UAE branch. Um, our LinkedIn page is um, continuing to increase the number of followers. So we're nearing the 1900 followers. Um, and you know, anyone who feels to uh, uh, participate or get linked with us, uh, please do so. Uh, we try to share as much information on double RSM, as well as on the UAE uh, um, information with all the members. So uh, please follow us on, on the, our LinkedIn site. Um, Risk Excellence Award, we talked about that last month as well. The um, applications are open for the 2024 Risk Excellence Awards, um, different categories, uh, which you can apply for or nominate until the 5th of February. Um, I would recommend to have a look at our new website um, and, uh, well, um, check out uh, how you can nominate either yourself or someone else in organization for the awards. An update, I will come back to you uh, later this week or this month uh, via our LinkedIn page. And the WhatsApp group is the Intersec, uh, which is uh, held in Dubai from 16th to 18th of January. Double RSM will be present uh, during the 17th and 18th uh, with two days of presentations, panel uh, sessions. Um, and what we try to do is with Philip um, visiting Dubai is to arrange around that same time a face-to-face -face, uh, branch meeting where we can ask our questions to Philip, uh, where we get updates from RISM uh, and make it a first since the pandemic face-to-face uh, um, -face live session uh, with members. Um, I'm looking very much forward to that. We're now in a stage where we try to arrange for a location and set the date. Uh, but the moment we have those dates available, uh, we will get back to you via the uh, communication channels as WhatsApp and, and our LinkedIn page. Training courses. Um, no new developments in training courses provided by RSM. Uh, they all start again in January. Uh, risk us, managing risk, the essentials on January 16th, followed in February by managing health and safety risks, the essentials. Um, and for the moment, those are the only two training courses uh, in the system, which will be uh, uh, repeated in May and June of next year as well. I expect that once we in January that the training calendar will be updated with uh, with new training uh, courses. But for the moment, it's, uh, it's these two courses starting in January. Same basically for the branch meetings. Uh, we have a limited number of branch meetings scheduled for the remaining of December and early January, all to do with the 
uh, festive season. So, um, it's, yeah, just a few left. Qatar has their branch meeting on the 19th, so next week, on HSE competency matrix. And then we have four UK-based uh, branch meetings, uh, one this year on December 14th, so that will be tomorrow, uh, building on traditional uh, occupational safety and health perspectives. And then we start in January with the Southwest branch meeting on January 16th. Blaming someone, is it really so simple? Uh, January 18th, the Northwest branch meeting, uh, elevating arboriculture safety standards. And then at the moment, the last one that is listed is the Northeast branch meeting on conflict management. Um, again, if... If uh, our website has the previous webinars um, uh, listed, uh, links to the YouTube channel are available. <clears throat> so anyone who wants to um, review any of the webinars, please visit our uh, website or YouTube channel. One important note for everybody that is not yet a member, um, we mentioned um, during the previous uh, webinars the advantages of be becoming a member. Um, those advantages are still there, uh, but RISM has decided that from the 1st of February next year, the uh, fees for new members will be increased. Uh, existing members, uh, will not be part of this increase. So your renewal will be um, at the same price. Uh, it's only for new members that the price uh, is increased. So those who still doubting to get uh, a membership, um, please do so before the 1st of February if you want to uh, have the advantage of the current member fee structure. Uh, again, from the 1st of February, it will be an uh, increased membership fee. Future branch meetings. Um, we have our branch meetings on the second Wednesday of the month. So for January, that would be the 10th of January. Um, we put this on tentative. Uh, reason for that is that uh, Intersec will take place the week after January 10th, so we might uh, postpone our branch meeting with a week to make sure that we uh, have that meeting together with uh, with Philip present in uh, in the UAE. Um, that's for the updates. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Elodie. Uh, for the overview of uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia workplace health and safety regulatory requirements. Um, if I can hand over to you, Elodie. Thank you. Thank you, Branko. Uh, I'll just share my screen. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm so glad to be with you today. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Elodie Shalhou. Uh, I'm an associate at Clyde & Co. Dubai branch. Uh, I'm a qualified lawyer uh, in Beirut, uh, and I have extensive experience in litigation and health and safety in the region, including UAE and Saudi. Uh, I appreciate the time that we have today. It's just uh, 50 minutes left. Uh, so I'll try as much as possible to give you all the information that I have uh, in an efficient way, even though the pre presentation might be a bit um, longer. Uh, Andy, so, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Is there any chance you can speak up a little or turn your volume up? I think a few people are yeah, I think difficult. That's now it's better. better? Yes, yeah, that's yeah, much it's better. Thank the, you. <laughs> it's just the microphone. No worries. Thank you. 
So um, the contents of our presentation, you'll see that we'll touch based on an overview in UAE and KSA regarding health and safety. And then we will go through a bit of the liability arising of any incidents that might happen um, at a workplace. Uh, as a general comment before I start, is just to let you know that there is no dedicated health and safety law in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So everything that we'll be discussing will be based on the sources of law that I'll be mentioning in the next slides. So in the UAE, starting for that, and you'll see that most of our uh, slides are based UAE because Saudi adopts the same principles, but they don't have yet any codified or law that sets out these principles. So the Sharia principles applies to any laws in the UAE, including health and safety. And then we have federal legislation in the country, which are applicable to specific matters. In this case, for health and safety, we have the penal code, which touch, touch base on, um, on health and safety matters, civil code as well. And then we have the labor law. Uh, as you know, uh, the labor law is applicable. It's, that is a federal labor law that is applicable to all companies in the UAE, except companies in the free zone like the GIFC and the ADGM. They have their own employment regulation. So nevertheless, all of these law include provisions to cover health and safety in the region. And then we have specific ministerial resolution or some free zone specifically that might have some regulation that can cover health and safety uh, around the region or the sector that a uh, company may be implemented and working in such free zones. And then in the UAE, we have also Emirates specific regulations. So for example, in Abu Dhabi, we have the Oshad rules. Uh, in Dubai, we have the Dubai municipality rules. So again, there are plenty of, um, of sources of law related to health and safety. And I would say the key principle here is there is no one source of law related to health and safety. And this is a challenge that we usually face in case of any matter or incident, you'll have to look all, under all these laws, uh, what is applicable and what will happen. Now in Saudi, as I mentioned, we have very little codified law. So again, we have the Sharia principles that governs all the legislation in the kingdom. Uh, we have the social insurance legislation, which has some security system provided for compensation in case of any incident. And then we have the labor law and the ministerial resolution, but again, not very specific to criminal prosecution or civil prosecution. It's just mainly for an employment perspective. Uh, key principles, as I mentioned, we don't have a single dedicated health and safety law in either the UAE or in KSA. Uh, we have different piece of legislation and regulation. So I think the best thing for you to do is uh, whenever you have an issue, whether it is in the employment uh, aspect of an incident or health and safety, is just to first look at the employment labor law at, uh, and at your obligations and rules that needs to apply. And then we would look more specifically whether this constitutes a crime, an offense, and then or it's just a civil casualties. And then you would further extend to look at these other law. Now, um, different entities within a group may be subject to different health and safety obligation. Definitely, this is because different uh, companies may operate in a different sector, different uh, health and safety uh, obligation would apply depending on the sector that you work in and the, the risk that you're exposed to. Uh, all the legislation in both of the countries, UAE and KSA are in Arabic. And therefore uh, we don't have unfortunately official translation, but I would usually say, get these translation from uh, dedicated sources or platform. Uh, I will not mention, but of course there is plenty of them um, in both jurisdiction. And then because we work in a civil law jurisdiction in UAE and in KSA, we don't have a system of binding precedent. This means that we've seen a lot of cases where we had the same fact, the same incident and different judgment and different outcome being applicable at such, such, such incident. And this is where it comes to an element of unpredictability. And to be honest, in Saudi, it's more unpredictable than 
in the UAE because also we don't have any guidance from criminal perspective or civil perspective as to what will happen in case of an incident. Um, may I ask everyone to mute their mic because I can hear some. I think Branco. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, just one second. Now, we have a very common question that we always get asked regarding risk assessment and whether from a legal perspective in the UAE and KSA, employer need to conduct a risk assessment related to your activity, to your establishment, whenever, for example, you have a project on site specifically for construction company. Now, in both jurisdictions, what you need to know is that you're not legally obliged and there is no specific uh, method to do a risk assessment or to submit it to specific um, to specific authorities. However, what we see it from a practical perspective, companies do conduct a risk assessment only to know whether, for example, this specific project will require additional health and safety measure. Would it require, for example, a health and sa safety officer being present at the time of us, for example, doing this specific project uh, or not. So, so I would definitely advise every establishment and depending on your activity that you conduct a risk assessment, whether you have a project or not to know what you need to do in order to protect your employees, not to fall under any breaches or also not to be convicted criminally under both jurisdictions. Now, the health and safety obligation that derives from the labor law, and I would say these are a bit common between the UAE and KSA, and then these are the only health and safety, safety explicit obligation that you can find under a codified law in post jurisdiction. Um, I just want to mention that if you have any question, uh, please ask question, like feel free to ask question whenever I finish a slide, or if you're more comfortable to put the question in writing in the message box, I will check it uh, at the end of each, each section. Um, under the UAE labor law, you'll see that we have under Article 13, we have employer's obligation. The employer obligation are broad, and then they would include specified obligation related to health and safety. The first one is that every employer needs to provide adequate means for protection against potential workplace hazards, provide appropriate training, provide a safe and appropriate work environment, inform employees of risk associated with work. Now, you'll see also the next um, column as well, provide additional, um, additional obligation under the executive regulation. Before I proceed and I, I, I go through, through each one of them, I just want to say that these obligations are very important, even though they are very broad. Um, based on my experience in the criminal court in, in the UAE, uh, you'll see that the judge will look whether an employer has complied with their obligation first before they are able to assess the matter and see whether there is an employee's fault or the incident happened because there is an external um, external force or something that is not in the hand of both the employer and the employee. But first, they would look at the implementation at these obligations at a workplace. Most common one is display health and safety instruction in prominent places. And I would say this is one of the most important obligation because whenever there is an inspection that happens by the police or the public prosecutor, the first thing they will look at is whether, for example, there is any health and safety instruction related to either the workplace where the incident happened or, for example, a specific machine or a specific, uh, a specific um, tool that the employee is using and how should he use it and what are the health and safety precautional measures that the employee should have taken. Just to give you a quick question, uh, sorry, a quick example uh, regarding uh, these obligations that I've seen putting it putting in practice. Uh, we had we had an incident where uh, an employee was working on a specific machine um, 
and it was very clear in the instruction of the health and safety that the employee shouldn't be wear wearing a watch, uh, should be wearing goggles, should be wearing gloves, and should be wearing the specific uh, outfit that is provided by the establishment before using the specific machine. And then the incident that happened is that this employee has been working for more than seven years with the company. He's fully aware and capable and expert in using this machine. And once he decided to use it while wearing a watch and not putting any of the precautionary um, um, outfits. Um, and then unfortunately he got, his hand was stuck in the machine and then he lost his hand. Just, just a quick uh, point on this matter is then when the police came, directly they check if one, we have put like the health and safety instruction next to the specific machine, two, whether the employee was wearing the precaution health and safety outfit that he needed and also uh, the goggles and the, the gloves. And the second thing that they've seen is that he was wearing a watch and it was very clear in the instruction that you shouldn't be wearing any accessories in your hand while uh, working on this machine. Long story short, the company was not liable because it was a fault of the employee. And having a fault of an employee doesn't in itself constitute a waiver, but because the company followed all these obligations that I've put for you on the slide, they were exempted from any liability. So again, take these into consideration and see whether all of you, for example, comply with these obligation or not. And if you don't consider what measures you need to put in place in order to follow these obligation that are under the federal uh, labor law. From, uh, from uh, before I go into the employee's obligation, from a KSA perspective, you'll see that we have similar obligation for an employer. And you'll see that, again, the most common and the most important obligation is post safety instruction in prominent places in Arabic and in a language workers understand. This is, again, very important to have it in a language worker understand because, of course, like blue collars employees, specifically for construction companies, for example, they don't understand Arabic and sometimes they don't understand English. So considering putting it in a language that the employee understand. And then again, the same obligation like informing the employee of the risk associated with the job that they will be doing, provide them with necessary precaution to protect themselves against any risk, and then putting in place a first aid box at the workplace and also providing health and safety insurance in accordance with the have to provide a health insurance for all, for all your employees um, at the workplace. Now, from an employee's perspective, like, okay, these are the employer's obligation, but what is the employees require, required to do? Otherwise, they would be in breach of the health and safety at the establishment. You'll see if I go back to the UAE, because also, again, it's a bit similar between both jurisdictions, is that the employee need to perform the work as provided to him. They must follow the health and safety instruction. You'll see that in the UAE, if someone breached the health and safety instruction, this can constitute a gross dismissal, immediate dismissal for the employee if they fail to follow any health and safety instruction. And then the last point is not to undertake any act that resulted in the failure to follow instruction of misuse, damage, or destruction of the means designed to protect health and safety of the worker. So again, anything that is done voluntarily by the employee to cause any harm is also a breach of the health and safety. So these are the obligation of the employee. You'll see again, the obligation of an employee under the Saudi labor law are similar. So implement health and safety instruction as prescribed so as the, the employer would have provided you. Again, if you see the last one also, it's very similar to the UAE obligation not to undertake any act that result in the misuse of any means designed to protect health and safety. So they are really common, I would say similar. Um, and, and this is where we see that the same rules, even though there is no codified law in, in Saudi related to criminal and civil, the same 
rules that are followed in the UAE, we're seeing them applicable in Saudi, even though like it's very different, just because the obligation under the labor law are pretty similar. I'll just stop on the obligation uh, to, to, to see if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, I can see questions on the Q&A, so I will, I will uh, respond. So someone said, please highlight Abu Dhabi Oshad. Uh, the Oshad regulations are applicable in Abu Dhabi. Uh, they are very, there, there is plenty of rules and regulation issues. You can find them online on the Abu Dhabi Oshad website. Uh, and then if you operate in Abu Dhabi, I would say you must be familiar with these regulations. I will not go through them because there are plenty and they are very specific to the activity and the sector which, which the company is working under. Um, another question is, we have small projects in KSA and UAE, but the number of people are maximum 10. What the requirement to have fully time safety officer and risk assessment? Now, the obligation to have a health and safety officer will arise if you have 50 plus employees. So basically you don't need a health and safety officer if you have less. Now, definitely if you are operating on project basis, so for example, if you're a construction company or any company that is doing on-site uh, uh, work, then definitely on-site work will require health and safety officer. But in the in the company, in order for you to hire a health and safety officer, the requirement arise for 50 plus employees. Um, concerning insurance requirement, how can we differentiate life insurance and workman compensation insurance? This is a very good question because basically when you put, uh, there is an obligation under the Dubai health insurance and Abu Dhabi and also in Saudi to provide a medical insurance coverage, which is a basic to your employees. Now, this insurance doesn't cover all the liability that may arise from a health and safety incident, unfortunately. So for example, if an incident happened and we're gonna see them in more details in the later slide, but just to give a quick example, if an incident happened and an employee, for example, isn't able to conclude work, from an employment perspective, you as an employer are is obliged to fully pay the employee for six months for his treatment. You're obliged to pay for his salary. You cannot, for example, not pay the salary. But then if the employee claim an additional compensation from a civil perspective or criminal perspective, let's say in case of disability, this is where sometimes we see insurance company being brought into the claim. So even though you have an insurance that may cover some of the incidents, you cannot get rid of some of your obligation under the labor law to continue, for example, paying for the employee. In Saudi, it's, I would say, less burden because the, the go see, and we will see, I, I'm jumping slides, but you'll have to pay a contribution every month for employees under GOSI, which is the General Organization for Social Insurance. And then GOSI will cover any compensation that is due to be paid for employees. So your, your liability is limited in Saudi, whereas in the UAE, you'll, you're always gonna be subject to a liability. Um, How effective the obligation are fulfilled to the workplace by employers if the employers are compromising on resources and budget? To, to be honest and to respond to this question, I wouldn't say the health and safety obligation uh, would, would mean that you have to spend more budget. It's more about training your employees internally. You can train them through your own resources putting health and safety instruction at the workplace isn't something that will cost much of a budget. Having a first aid kit at the workplace is mandatory. And again, it's not really cost uh, issue. So if you see the, 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 the minimum requirement, I'm not saying that you need to provide external training, you need to send your employees into external health and safety trainings, so on and so forth. It's just having the minimum as per the labor law. First of all is, uh, 
is better for the company in case of an incident to prove that you've complied with all your obligation and to push liability. And then from another perspective is definitely number one, the health and safety of your employees, which should be prioritized over any other budget uh, in the company. But I, I would say from a practice perspective, all of our clients, and as I see in market practice, prioritize health and safety, because to be honest, the compensation and the liability is really high if something goes wrong. So you better take precautionary measures before it happens. Um, the last question is that you stated from a legal compliance perspective, there is no requirement to conduct risk assessment. But it is in place referred to OSHA technical guideline process of risk management. I appreciate, appreciate if you can clarify. So from a legal perspective, from a federal labor law, there is no uh, federal labor law and also from federal laws in the UAE or in KSA, there is no requirement to do a risk assessment. So no one's going to come and if you breach or if you don't conduct a risk assessment, no one's going to come and penalize you. However, from OSHAD regulations and other, for example, Dubai municipality regulation, you'll see that there are guidelines for companies to follow a specific risk assessment before implementing a specific project or going through any, uh, for example, high risk uh, projects. It's just for, for your guidance and for you to follow in case of any breach in Abu Dhabi, definitely the judge will look at the OSHAD regulation and they will see whether a company has complied with these guidelines or not. So definitely I would advise to look at, as I mentioned at the beginning, depending on where you're based, I would say comply with the regulation and the guidelines that are provided by specific authorities. But from a federal perspective, there is no, again, I would mention it, there is no legal requirement to do a risk assessment. So um, just to conclude on this slide from an employment perspective and uh, to summarize whatever has been mentioned, um, labor law spe specify very generic and basic standards, as I mentioned. All employees are treated the same, either they are national or foreigners, everyone is treated the same in relation to the obligation, the compensation that we will discuss later in the slide. The labor law provide a minimum position and then, of course, as a company, you can always enhance definitely the health and safety precaution measures that you take, enhance the protection that you offer to your employees, uh, maybe provide additional training, so on and so forth. That is not required by law. So again, risk assessment is not required, but as a company, you can enhance this position and provide additional um, additional protection to your company. There are rules and regulations that are specified by OSHAD and Dubai municipality and other ministerial resolution uh, that you need to uh, follow. And you need to, um, if you want to take as a guideline because there is no specific source of law. So it's better for you at least to have a reference when you implement any of these um, in place. And, um, have a health and safety, I would say, um, policy in place. We always we always advise our clients to have a health and safety uh, policy in place. We tend to see a lot of health and safety that are 100 pages, really big, that would cover anything that may happen at the workplace. But again, try to be a bit more uh, specific, more rational when it comes to health and safety policy, try to make it a bit meaningful, shorter, straight to the point. So for example, have a simple English use so employees can always access it and knows what, what, what I can do, what I cannot do. And then it's really accessible and employee friendly rather to have like a 100 page that even for example, HR manager wouldn't look into. So this is from an employment perspective and these applies to both jurisdiction. Now working hours come and falls under the health and safety because working hours in both jurisdiction have been taken into account to uh, balance the, the employee's work life, uh, to, to have a work-life balance, to be honest, for employees. And then we'll see that both, both jurisdiction implement very strict approach to working hours. Now, if we look at the UAE and KSA, you'll see that they are a bit similar. 
uh, one to another. So in the UAE, we have maximum working hours of eight hours a day, 48 hours per week. The common question that I, 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 I um, get asked as a lawyer is, if we, for example, if employees agree to work 11 hours a day, but less days a week, is this fine? The answer is that each criteria is taken separately. So the 48 hours is per week. However, it's eight hours per day. So you cannot exceed the eight hours per day. There is only um, a possibility to have two additional hours, which are overtime. And then definitely an employee would get a payment on overtime. Now, this topic, to be honest, is very, very, very uh, interesting and can take up to two hours of discussion because there is plenty of um, there is plenty of approaches that an employer can take for shift employees, uh, for employees working in specific industries where they work like in rotation basis, uh, for employees that work in the evening, so on and so forth. So this is like the general position. But definitely, if you have an establishment that operate in specific hours, that you need you need to seek a specific advice because I will not be able to cover now everything that I've seen and all the um, all the, the the approaches that employers take usually in both UAE and KSA. Now in KSA, uh, nine hours per day, but this nine hour is inclusive of one hour lunch break, so it comes to to uh, the same as in the UAE. Ramadan hours are uh, reduced to um, two hours uh, in both jurisdictions. So basically it's six hours uh, six hours per day. And then in both jurisdictions over time is capped to two hours. And then you'll see like the labor law has recently changed in the UAE. And now there is an introduction of a cap over a period of three weeks. Uh, and this is really to manage that employees don't end up working more than 48 hours per week. So this is 144. If you divide it by three, you'll see that it wouldn't exceed the 48 hours per week. Whereas in, in Saudi, the cap is per year and it's 720 hours per year. Um, rest breaks, as I mentioned, it's one hour break for every five consecutive hours. In Saudi, it's 30 minutes for every five hours. And then there is two rest days per week in Saudi. One of them is Friday. However, in the UAE, with the recent changes, they removed Friday to be the official day off. So now you can choose any day off. And then it's just one day, so people can work six days a week. Whereas in, in Saudi, they need to work five days a week. Uh, I'll just see if we have any question and then uh, I'll proceed. Uh, Victor has asked a question regarding when an incident occur. I will just say that I will reach to this point by, by the next slide so I don't jump into slides. I will just explain, um, I'll just explain uh, what happens when an incident uh, occur uh, at the workplace. And then I will also explain more about what the police will look at, who will be investigated, what we've seen. So I'll just keep it to, to the next slide if, if, if this is fine. Uh, in UAE, any specific regulation on working hours and off days? So yes, uh, but in both, in both jurisdictions, the labor law and the implementing regulation, now in the UAE, because the law has changed, the implementing regulation provide more detail about working hours, who's exempted from overtime, and then it provides for different uh, patterns of work. Uh, so you can find them under the federal law and the implementing regulation. And the same in Saudi, you can find them under the labor law and the implementing regs. Uh, there is a, a ministerial resolution, and I would say this is basically for sectors that operate under the heat that have blue coll collars employee. It can be any type of employee, but what we've seen most commonly in the UAE, it's people working on construction sites. There has been an announcement that work is prohibited due to the health and safety because we've seen a lot of cases before this law was issued where uh, employees would uh, go unconscious uh, at site. Uh, we've seen also a lot of health issues um, associated with someone working under the heat in the UAE. So again, 
um, this resolution prohibit work between 12.30 and 3 p.m. under the sun, we're talking, so it's not someone working uh, inside definitely a closed place. Um, you, as an employer, if you're in any of these industries, you should provide a shaded place for your employees to have the rest break. So they should have somewhere to stay. They should have water. They should have, um, as, I, as I said, cold drinks and also like, anything that gives them some energy, first aid should be also provided. Uh, there is a very high breach if uh, any of these employers don't comply. It's 30,000 uh, dirham breach per each breach. So it's not like overall. In Saudi, it's more strict. There is a ban on working outdoors in summer. So between June and September, uh, between noon and 3 p.m. So basically, I would say is, um, it's pretty similar, but in Saudi, they are more strict when it comes to the uh, the period when this ban is implemented. Um, Branko, you have a question? Uh, no, sorry, no. Okay. Um, Thank you. No worries. Now, uh, just to respond to to do question before I move. So Rasib has asked Rasib Hussein for both countries. Yes. So for both countries, there is a prohibition uh, on working in these specific hours during summer break, not summer break, during the summer season in, in UAE and KSA, which is June to September. Um, the other question for heat stress, is there a maximum working? So basically the, the, the working hours shouldn't exceed eight hours a day, which is the same that is applicable for other employees uh, under both jurisdictions. So there is no specific working hours if someone is working on site. However, as I mentioned before, if your employees are working in a rotational basis or shift basis, uh, definitely there is like an exception on this 12, 12 hours work with specific break times. And this is again, specific to your um, to the way you operate. But I, I wouldn't go because it's very specific and it requires a lot of additional information that I don't want to mention and uh, opt other on uh, opt out other information. Uh, is that a maximum temperature? No, there is no maximum temperature. It, it's very specific that during these months and during these hours, you shouldn't be working. So for example, if during a month of June, there is no sun, you still have to apply this uh, resolution. There is no exception whenever you see if like the temperature is below, let's say 40, you can uh, allow your employers to work. There is no exception. It's very strict in the application. So if, for example, and, and usually it's on site. So whenever that is, let's say an inspection, we, 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 we see a lot of um, police or whenever stopping and, and seeing employees working during this hour. So there is no, to be honest, uh, going way, way around it because it's very visible to everyone that these employees are working during this hours. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just gonna uh, skip some of the slides, but again, if you have any question, I'll answer them um, at, at, at the end of the session. So uh, very quick, female employees, there is no specific health and safety regarding uh, uh, women employees, that is only the maternity leave, which is under the labor law. So this is only that. Um, in KSA, there is a prohibition on women working in specific hours between 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. However, there are now some, some if you want, exemption to, um, to women employees working. And the main one that I would mention is if there is any CCTV operating at the workplace, then employees can work during, female employees can work during these hours. And you can see on the slide there are other uh, things to take in mind when hiring a woman employee to work between 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, other, other obligations are uh, in Saudi, which are employers need to provide adequate seating for female employees to take that break. So like specific female facilities, which are definitely separate from male facilities. Uh, if a company operate 50 plus employees, they are required to provide babysitting facilities at the workplace. So this is again, something to consider. If someone operates uh, with 100 plus employees in the kingdom, they have to establish a nursery 
for for female employee to care for their children. And then there is definitely rest break in both jurisdiction in the UAE and KSA for breastfeeding after uh, the birth of a child. Now, I would say this is the most important part, which I will try to, to, to go through in, in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, the potential liability in case of a workplace injury. Now, there is definitely different horizon. Uh, and this slide summarizes everything that I'll be saying in the next slide. So that is a liability that comes from the contract. So from the employment contract or where, for example, you hire an outsourcing health and safety officer or where you hire like a subcontractor or any other companies to operate on a specific site or at the workplace. So check the terms of the contract. Everything that you mentioned there can lead to a liability. So the contractual one. We have the labor law obligation, which are under the law and no, don't require any contractual um, agreement. So everything that I've mentioned under the labor law would rise a liability on an employer or an employee. Uh, there are administrative sanctions that are applicable in case of a breach, for example, of the health and safety obligation. There are criminal liability, which is the most common liability in the UAE. Uh, and we will say that in Saudi, because there is no codified um, criminal uh, code at the moment, uh, we have less likely seen criminal liability arising because usually GOSI will cover the compensation and an employee will have nothing, like no ground to, to complain. And then there is a civil liability where, for example, let's say you as a company, you are required to pay a compensation for specific incident and then for example you would go back on your insurance company or on your subcontractor or anyone who has caused the civil liability you would go and remedy um, will have measures to remedy against this loss so these are the liability i will i will just i wouldn't really go through them in a very uh, detailed way but as i mentioned the contract check always the the obligation and the health and safety provision, uh, potential breach put, for example, any liquidated damages in case someone breached the contract or in case of any incident. Uh, from a labor law perspective, uh, you'll see that in both jurisdiction in the UAE and in KSA, um, the, the, the workplace injury is defined very broadly and the most, the, the, the most important point to note is that workplace injury can happen during work, because of work, or because of the performance of work. Um, and I would say that just giving examples for you to be aware of, if you, for example, provide any social events, any uh, after work uh, plans for your employees, even like if you take your employees on a trip or business trip or anything happening at the workplace, all of these are considered under the workplace um, definition, workplace injury. And you can see it as stated on the slides. I will not really go through them now, but you'll see that it's very broad and would include any type of incident that may happen. So you need to be always ready to, uh, to, to prove that you as an employer have followed the health and safety obligation. Uh, and then it, it, it's not necessarily that you are exempted because the employee has done something wrong. This is a misconception that we see in both jurisdiction that first, when I get a complaint, the employer will tell me, yeah, but the employee that's this wrong. So again, from an employer perspective, in order to uh, push, if you want, or defend yourself as a company, you'll see that the exemptions under the UAE labor law and the KSA labor law are stated on the slide. For example, if the employee has intended to injure himself, which is under both jurisdiction, if an employee is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, intentionally ignore uh, safe, um, health and safety instruction, committed uh, a gross misconduct, or refuse to adopt a specific treatment, you'll see that the exemption under the labor law are less but would include some of the same. So for example, intended to injure himself, intentionally uh, misconduct resulted in his injury and without re reason refused to be examined by a physician. Now, these are if, if an employee has done any of these, 
definitely this will help you to be exempted from any liability arising from the incident. But again, the most common and successful approach that we've seen is companies proving that they followed the health and safety obligation that are mentioned under the labor law and also specific regulation in the guidelines where you're operating and where you are able to prove. So for example, I've provided training for these employees. You have a record of these trainings. You have a record who was present uh, uh, on site uh, and you've provided health and safety instruction at the workplace, which are very visible to everyone. Uh, you followed everything that we've mentioned. Then this is this will help your case to, to, to push liability and to be exempted. Otherwise, if you've done nothing and simply an employee, for example, I don't know, was drunk and fall on, on the dance floor in a company event, this in itself will not will not uh, exempt you from liability. So again, it's it's both ways. Um, uh, it's 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 I would say both parties way to evidence what happened and what each of them has done in order to conclude. And again, it's all subject to court discretion and what evidence you can show. Um, the implications uh, and I I. This is in response to some of the questions that were asked before. So what happens in case of an incident? So first of all, in the UAE, under a ministerial resolution uh, number 657 of 2022, if you want to note it down, that is a specific obligation to report uh, to the police and to the medical authorities and also to the Ministry of HR any injury that happens within 48 hours. So this is the first obligation. Now in Saudi, we don't have a specific obligation to report. As I said, we don't have a specific codified law for criminal or civil, but um, but we have, uh, but we would always like encourage company to notify so it doesn't draw back on, on the company. Um, Administrative fine for failing to, to, to follow the health and safety uh, obligation as an employer are between five and one million dirham for breach. And this is like an administrative fine that is provided very broadly in, in the UAE labor law. Um, to, to pay for medical treatment, and this was a question that was asked, so another implication like, are you liable to pay for medical treatment? Now in KSA, as I mentioned, usually go see. So every employer has an obligation to pay 2% uh, for national and non-national towards the insurance coverage. So in case anything happened of an incident, you as an employer will not be liable of anything and the go see will pay compensation and will cover any medical treatment. Now in the UAE, uh, your medical insurance should usually cover the, 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 the treatment. However, if your insurance doesn't provide, for example, uh, a package or a benefit or a coverage to, to, to um, compensate the employee for the medical treatment, unfortunately, you as an employer will have to, to cover. And this is why you need to choose carefully your insurance provider. Uh, to maintain salary from an employment perspective, in case an incident happened that resulted, let's say, in an on, uh, uh, inability to come to work because of an injury, uh, you will have to continue paying the salary for the next six months until the employee is recovered or is uh, considered disabled and unable to uh, return to work. In KSA, it's capped at two months full salary and then 10 months uh, at 75% pay. But then if, again, the employee is unable to come back to work, Unfortunately, you'll have to let them go and terminate their employment. The compensation in case of a death and permanent disability, again, this is where an incident happened, the police are involved, and then there are criminal and civil prosecution against the employer, the insurance, or anyone that is involved. In case of a compensation, the law cap the compensation to 200,000 dirhams in the UAE. In KSA, there, there are different caps that would be applicable for national and, uh, and non-national. I'm just checking if I have uh, the cap. Yeah, so I have the caps here. They are 330,000 Saudi Riyal for permanent total disability, and then 165,000 Saudi Riyal for, per, for 
partial disability. And in case of a death, it's 330,000 Saudi Riyal. So it's just by way of information for you to know. Now, uh, the last thing that I would like to cover, so uh, a question that, that was asked is what happened if an incident happened, what the police will be looking at? And this is a very good question, like will the police be looking at the health and safety officer or someone who's responsible from the company side, so on and so forth. So in practice, what we've seen, uh, again, in the UAE, because in KSA, it's less likely for these to be like a big thing. So whenever an incident happened, yes, the police are involved. But again, because everything is covered under GOSI and then employees are being paid, we, we rarely see any type of prosecution happening. Unless that is a death and then the police want to prosecute or the public prosecutor want to prosecute the company individually. Now, from a UAE perspective, the first thing that happens is that the police will come. They will um, they will uh, zone the area where the incident happened. They will put restriction on anyone stepping in. And the first thing they will ask is who is the health and safety officer responsible on site? And usually we see it more in construction or any other um, uh, sites where we have like work being conducted or even let's say at the workplace where it's not uh, very similar to, to these type of incident. They will ask who's responsible. So for example, if we don't have a construction thing happening or anything related to other big projects, they will ask who's responsible on site. Uh, if, and in most cases we've seen, sometimes we don't have a health and safety officer. We don't have any senior manager pro like available on site. And these are absent. These people will usually be uh, called by the police to investigate where they were, why they were not on site, and who is responsible in their absence. So these people are usually the most common people to be um, to be questioned and to be, I wouldn't say directly liable, but they would be responsible for the incident until they've proven otherwise. Now, because we don't have a corporate manslaughter regime, which means that the company will not be liable from a criminal perspective. Unfortunately, the criminal liability will fall on an individual. And this is why I'm saying that usually it's whoever is responsible on site, and in most cases, the health and safety officer is the one that is responsible. And it would depend on definitely the, the circumstances and who's responsible. In case of a an incident happening happening at the workplace, for example, usually, for example, they would call um, the 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 office manager that is responsible for the office, okay. or okay. anyone that is responsible for the uh, for for the work being done. So this is usually what happens. Uh, the public police will investigate, public prosecutor will investigate, and then if they see that there is a valid case of any fault on any of these person, they will transfer the case to the criminal court. If they think that there is nothing, like it's pretty clear that there is no criminal prosecution, they will just dismiss the complaint. Last thing I would like to mention, because I know that we are very short on time, is that always put, uh, always be aware that if you are being asked to come to the police, don't sign any paper that are in Arabic that you don't understand. Always ask for a translator and never say something that you haven't seen in your own eyes, but you've heard like, I know that this person wasn't there. So if you, you haven't seen it yourself, just say, I wasn't there. I don't know. It's better not to incriminate yourself rather than saying stuff that may not be correct or um, or uh, will will really like uh, worsen your situation. So this is everything I have to say. I know that there are a lot of things that we can still cover, uh, but um, we are done on time. So it's already seven. So. This is, I will just leave this slide so you can see the process of investigation in both countries. And then if you have any follow-up question, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And I think we're done, Branko. I know that there are questions, but unfortunately, I it's, think we're short on <clears throat> time. I, I, I can only thank you very much for your presentation. I think it was, um, uh, if we would have had another hour, we probably would be able to fill it with another hour. Yeah, yeah. What I what I suggest is that anybody who still has questions, um, 
let them uh, pl please forward them to our email address uh, or put them in our WhatsApp group. I will collect them and I will reach out to LOD to see if we can kind of collide them and, and get the answers out back to everyone. Um, but yeah, from, from my side, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. It gave a lot of insights. I think uh, a lot give it, given a number of uh, questions and uh, yeah, interesting for a lot of people. Um, as we do always the, um, uh, what is it? The, the webinar, the branch meeting will be, uh, is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and as I said, if there's any question, please reach out to uh, uh, the UAE branch and we will collide the questions and uh, answers to uh, to feedback to all of you um on on a final note from my side um and that's a bit different i would like to thank noor for all his work for the branch committee uh noor recently <clears throat> accepted a job outside of the uae so he's about to relocate to oman um but from my side thank you very much for everything you did for the branch committee and I wish you all the best uh, in your future career and maybe we come across each other uh, in the future. Um, thank you, Elodie. Thank you, thank you. for everybody thank you so who much. attended. Um, I'll look forward to meeting all of you again uh, in January and hopefully that will be a face-to-face -face meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Thanks. Bye.